everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tennis.com podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Nina Pantic. I'll be joined by Irina Falcone as usual, and our special guest is doubles pro Nick Monroe. He's currently ranked inside of the top 100 in doubles and has been as high as number 253 in singles and number 30 in doubles. He recently reached the quarterfinals of the French Open with Tommy Paul, and he's probably one of the most motivated guys on tour that embodies having a passion for the game. In our interview with him, he shares what keeps him going, and it's really, really impressive. He tells us what's been the hardest part of 2020, what COVID testing is like, and all the different tournament bubbles that he's been a part of, why he's been teaming up with singles players so much lately, including Francis Tiafo at the upcoming Australian Open, and he shed some insight into what it's like working with his father from a very young age and even now after 20 years on the ATP tour. And he also tells us why Austin is such a good home base for him. He's become one of the newest faces on Tennis Channel Live and doing some commentary. We ask him all about that experience. Let's get into our interview with Nick Monroe. All right, Nick Monroe, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Uh, great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Tell us where you are. Are you back home? What's where, where in the world? Are you? Where in the world are you? Yeah, so I'm in Austin, Texas, right now. Uh, just got back a few days ago from Europe. So I just spent almost two months over there uh, playing, played the French Open and Cologne and Antwerp. Uh, so a few events over there, and and so yeah, just happy to be back home. It's, I feel like it's been a while since I've been back home, but it, but it feels good to be able to play tennis again and but now I'm back home and enjoying that side of it are you shutting it down for the year are you done yeah shutting it down for the year um I think there's only a couple more tournaments left on the calendar ATP wise and a few challengers but we uh we're having to go to Australia kind of mid-December like December 15 16 something like that so shutting it down for the year and then and then gear up for heading over there what was for you the hardest part of the shutdown and where did you spend that period um, you know what, the hardest part of the shutdown was just not having any idea when we were going to play again, you know, and just kind of trying to figure out schedules and, you know, should I practice this week or next week or, you know, what kind of preseason should I have leading into whatever the events might be. Um, but I spent all my entire time in Austin, Texas, home base. Um, my, my, here with my wife, my dad lives here, my brother's here. So a lot of, a lot of good family time. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was actually a joke because it, it's the longest time that I've spent in Austin in 10 years. I mean, I've been here 10 years and that was the longest, you know, few months I was here back to back, which normally I come in town for, I don't know, a few weeks or a month or something. But, you know, to be here for two and a half, three months was was fun. You know, I got to see a different side of Austin. I got to see the hot side of Austin. I never really been here kind of in the beginning of summer. I'm like, geez, it's hot here, you know, and people are like, yeah, this is where you've been living for 10 years. And I was like, wow, I never, I never knew, knew this side of Austin. So this is normal. So yeah, yeah, this is normal, but it wasn't normal for me. So yeah, it's been great. It's been great. I mean, you just have to kind of just roll with the punches and take the positive out of yeah. it. Right? I mean, yeah, hanging no, with family is not a bad thing. Yeah, no, hanging with family was great. And, and again, it was just, it was, more the side of like, oh, wait, when do I start training or what do I start doing, you know, and just not having it and, and you know, something to work for. Um, but uh, but then once we kind of knew tournaments coming back in a certain date, then, yeah, then we get back on it. Knowing you, though, you probably never stopped working out. Let's be honest, <laughs> Nick. Let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, I didn't really stop working in the gym. I, I, I love that side of it. I love just kind of trying to stay as fit as I can be and try to be the best athlete that I can be, which, which then can help on the tennis court whenever you start actually hitting balls. So, yeah. It shows where, uh, <laughs> that was creepy. Where, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, lot of, <laughs> a lot of players that we talk to are based in Florida and California. Tell me why Austin, what drew you there? You know what? I moved here 10 years ago. There was a coach, Grant Doyle, who worked with Sam Query and Ryan Harrison, uh, back in the day. So coach Grant, who I knew from a long time ago. So, he was, he was here. And so 10 years ago, I wanted to work with him. Uh, my best friend from college, Jeff Boyd, who I played tennis with at Carolina was living here. So it kind of worked out. I was like, all right, I'll work with Grant, stay with my buddy, Jeff, and I'll just kind of travel as I was doing. And, and yeah, so it really worked out. And I fell in love with the city, um, you know, and Grant actually left after a few years, but I just fell in love with the city and stayed here ever since. So, and then next thing you know, my brother moved here about four years ago. My dad moved here a couple of years ago and, and my mom lives in Dallas. So everyone's kind of close by. That's really cool. So who do you yeah. train with now? 
So now, I mean, my dad's here. So my dad coached me from four years old. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm working with him and, and then, um, a lot of the UT players are close by. I lived in downtown Austin. So UT is just the two minute drive away. So I hit with a lot of the guys there. Um, and then, and then there's some local guys I hit with, but it's great. I mean, it's great training base. I work with Lance Hooten who worked with Andy Roddick on the, um, fitness side of things his whole career. So Lance is my fitness trainer. He works with major league baseball guys. So I have a good team here. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, I just really enjoy Austin, very laid back and, um, it's a great spot to be. What's the dynamic like change with your father? Because if you were young, when you guys started playing, obviously you were a little kid. Now you're 38. I don't want to blow you up your spot here, but yeah. how does yeah. that change? Cause obviously you've gotten older. You're a grown man now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny. It, it's uh, yeah. I mean, obviously you go back to all the junior tournaments and we used to drive everywhere. Like I grew up in Oklahoma. So we drive from Oklahoma to Miami for a tournament or Oklahoma to LA or Oklahoma to New York. So we, we're making these long drives and obviously, you know, had a great, have a great bond player coach, um, you know, and, and father player relationship, you know, it's two, two different things, but we have a great bond. And obviously, you know, as I was younger, it was more about like, we had a lot of hours on the court, four or five hours. And now it's kind of more quality than quantity, you know? And so we still put, put in the hours, but less hours together on court, but yeah, we just have a great relationship and, and uh, yeah, we're not really, when he comes to tournaments with me, we're not making those long drives anymore. We're, we're flying now to some of these events. So yeah, but you know, we have fun together on the court, off the court. Um, so yeah, it works well on both, both sides. We recently talked about how the dynamic of having a parent as a coach can be super great and also yeah. super not great. Uh, so I'm just curious it, for the people that are listening and have either kids that are, that they want to coach and their father or a mother, right. what, what would you say worked for you and your dad? You know what? I mean, once we were on the court, then it became just player coach and we were focused on the tennis. Right. And as soon as we got off the court, it just became, you know, son, father, you know, we, and we separated those things when we were off the court, we weren't talking tennis. Well, you need to hit your forehand better today and you need to hit the backhand better yesterday and whatever. So, you know, once we got off the court, it was more about like, all right, let's watch the basketball game that's on TV or let's, you know, do stuff other than tennis, you know, and then, okay, now we got back on the court and then we focused on that. So it was just being able to separate the two um, dynamics um, of just kind of daily life and tennis life. So I, you know, but again, we just had fun doing both. Right. So always when you're on the court, we're still having fun. If you're off the court, still having fun. Um, obviously there's, there's ups and downs. It can be tough when you're losing and, and when you're better, when you're winning, but you know, that's where, that's just what makes the bond stronger, but definitely just separating um, tennis and, and off court was, was huge for us. That sounds like a mature dad, Nina. That's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. what we were, we were wanting. We were talking about yeah. earlier. It's just, there's so much maturity that needs to happen from the parental side of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause I mean, you can see from, from the parent side, they want, just want their kids to be the best they can be. And, you know, let's talk about it all the time and you really need to work on this or that, but, you know, just keep that on the tennis court, you know, and then once you get off, let's, let's focus on other things and have fun as a family. Um, yeah. So that's just the most important. That's awesome. You've, yeah. <laughs> you've become more of a doubles player over the years. How did you tra like change from singles to doubles? I'm sure your father was a big part of all this and your family and your support system, but how did you get from that? Cause you were 253 in singles and now right. you're about even as high as 30 in doubles, how'd that right. go about? Yeah. So, you know, playing singles, I played singles. So I was 30 years old. Um, and, 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 in this game, I mean, basically, which is crazy to say, you don't really make money till you're top hundred in the world. And so I was 253 and playing very good tennis. I felt like, you know, like I would have a week where maybe I beat a guy top hundred and then maybe the next week I'd lose to a guy 400 or 500, but I still felt like I was playing very good tennis, but it's just in this sport, it's tough to make money you know, unless you're in the top hundred and then the ATP events and whatnot. So when I was 30, I said, you know what, let me give doubles a shot. I'd always kind of done well in doubles, but never really focused on it where to the point where sometimes I'd be in the semis of doubles and have to pull out of a match because I want to go play singles somewhere else and whatnot. So I was like, you know what, let me, let me really give this a shot and not be pulling out of tournaments and whatnot. And luckily I was able to find a partner kind of right away in the first challenger that I went to and Simon Stadler from Germany. And the next thing you know, we played two years straight, um, you know, within the first year we took each other to 50 in the world. And, you know, we 
So that was a transition was just trying to see, okay, how far can I get in doubles if I really focus on it? Because I knew I needed to be top hundred and the goal was to be in the grand slams main draw, because that's as a little kid, you watch Wimbledon and French open and Australia, you watch those tournaments. And so I wanted to be in those tournaments consistently as well as the ATP events where, where with my singles ranking at 250, I wasn't really able to get into the slams and able to get in the ATP events. It was just kind of very sporadic getting into qualifying of singles. And so I just kind of wanted to give it a good shot. You know, in juniors, I was always top three in the country in doubles with, with my partner, Travis Rettenmeyer. He's from California. And so anyways, I knew I could play well, but just want to give it a shot. So that's how global, that started. Global pandemic aside, what is job security like when you're focused on doubles? Do you feel like year in, year out, you're, you're able to provide and be stable and confident in what you're doing always? Or is there like, sometimes you're like, I should be, I should be out of this. No, I mean, <laughs> no, again, it's, it's one of those things where as long as you're kind of, you know, enjoying what you're doing, but as long as you're kind of in the ATP events and in the grand slams, that's where the money is, you know? And so for doubles, yeah, I mean, you gotta be in the top hundred. That's kind of a good, good marker. And then you can get in those big tournaments and that's what will help support your family and whatnot. But again, if you get kicked out of the top 100 or you're 150 and you're coming up, I mean, that's everyone. It just takes time, right? Like if you don't go up immediately, it takes time to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And, and you just got to believe in yourself, keep working hard. And, 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 you know, you can do it. Everyone can do it. You know, if you just keep pushing. Hi, everyone. You're tuning in to an episode of the Tennis.com podcast with pro Nick Monroe. He's sharing what keeps him motivated day in and day out after almost 20 years on the tour. Keep listening for more. You're 38 years old, which is incredible to be where you're at. I mean, you see players, we've seen it now more often that, you know, the longevity of the game is just so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Has there ever been a time where you're like, wow, I just want to keep playing until I'm like 45 years old? Or yeah. has yeah. there been moments during even before the pandemic where you were like, okay, I, I want to put the rackets down. No, not one, not once. I mean, it's one of those things where I, I, I've always told myself I want to play until the wheels fall off. You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of former, a lot of former players, a lot of former top doubles players, former top singles players. And, and I asked them, Hey, what, what's your biggest regret? I like to pick the brain of some of the former guys and 99% of them say, Hey man, play as long as you can. You're able to travel the world. You're able to hit a yellow ball over a net and call that your job, you know, like you have plenty of time the rest of your life to do whatever it is you want to do. But the fact that you're able to travel the world and play a sport, they're, they're like, keep going as long as you can, as long as you enjoy it. And for me, like I, I enjoy be running on the track. I enjoy being in the gym, trying to become the best athlete I can be. I enjoy being on the court as many hours I need to be like for my game. I'm not the most talented guy. So I'd love putting in the reps. I know I need to put in the reps and I, and I enjoy that. And, uh, so yeah, I've never, it has still to this day, hasn't even crossed my mind of wanting to put up the rackets just because look, I mean, you know, where my ranking is right now, I'm able to get in the Wimbledon's and the French opens and us opens and, and it, okay. At some point, maybe I'm not able to do that. And then maybe it's time and maybe I'm tired of playing, but you know, I, I don't want to have any regrets. I want to know I, I left everything out on the court that I could. And I left every ounce of blood, sweat and tears. I know that sounds whatever, but I left every ounce of that out there. Um, so that's, that's just always been my thing. And, and luckily for me, my, my wife supports that my family supports that. And, and, and uh, so yeah, that's just been kind of my mentality. Nina, did you get, just get fired up? Cause like I got chilled like, listening <laughs> oh, to like, I mean, going back on tour. <laughs> I know. Right. It's like, come on, let's go. That's yeah, awesome. That's so good to hear. Yeah, thanks, it's like, thanks. cause yeah. you don't really hear that very often and you don't really hear it when you're at near the end of your career. I mean, yeah. gosh, I mean, when I first started, I was like, wow, maybe this is not for me. And then 10 <laughs> years later, I was still saying it, but yeah. you know, you just yeah. go through those it's peaks and yeah. valleys. Yeah. I mean, obviously I mean, you know, there's weeks that you lose first round and you might, I mean, I've had times where I've lost four or five weeks in a row first round and you're in, in Germany, you lose first round on a Monday, you have to, you know, get ready for Poland. That's the next Monday, but you have six days there of what do you do, you know, but I enjoy that. I enjoy being like, all right, well, let's get back on the horse. Let's get back on the practice court. Yes. I'm living out of a bag and I'm in some random city I've never been to before, but 
that's the beauty of it, right? Like when's the next time you're going to go to Cologne, Germany, or when's the next time you're going to go to Antwerp, Belgium, or St. Petersburg, Russia, these places. So why not enjoy that and really just take it all in and enjoy the training, enjoy the food, enjoy the so people are like, well, what do you eat there? I was like, well, I'll find a good, so whatever I like there and I'll find it. I might eat the same thing for a whole week straight, but, but I'll enjoy it. But anyway, so I just, yeah, I mean, I just enjoy seeing different cultures, different places and, you know, that just gets me fired up, you know, so. You have a very awesome. pure passion for the game and you said you're also passionate <laughs> for working out and it's, it's, it's honestly like kind of mind blowing, but I want to talk about now post, uh, or I guess post COVID life, you've been in these yeah. bubbles pretty much since July in and out of bubbles, yeah. living the bubble yeah. life. You did tennis channel inside the bubble videos. I saw you doing a COVID test. Yeah. Uh, I imagine you've probably done like a hundred of those. So what has this <laughs> been like the new tennis normal? You know what? It, I think for the U S open Cincinnati U S open guys weren't sure what to expect. Right. Cause that was kind of the beginning of it. And then what they realized was like, okay, we're going to get tested on arrival. We're going to get tested 48 hours later. And then every like 72 hours after that. So, you know, you realize that people were worried, well, man, it's going to be no fans and how, how are we going to get fired up and whatever. But I mean, we're, for us, we're athletes and you want to compete, you want to win. Right. So as soon as you get out there and it doesn't matter if there's no fans, like you still want to win. So, you know, from that aspect of there being no fans, I think all the players have kind of gotten over that. And it's just like, you know, this is still our living. We're still trying to make money to move our ranking up and, and be able to support our family. But yes, for the COVID testing and whatnot, I mean, those COVID tests have been like completely different every week. I mean, one week they're going up both nostrils. The next week it's only up one nostril. The next week, two weeks ago, we were gargling water for 20 seconds. The next week they were, you know, touching the back of our throat. So every, every tournament has a different COVID test, but for us, it's like, we know that's just what we have to do. It is what it is. And, and you, you know, I think in the beginning, everyone was just so tight and so worried about like, okay, I can't, I can't even look at anyone because I don't want to test positive, you know? So everyone was just like so tight to like make sure that we're able to play the tournaments where then after like three, four weeks, it's kind of like, all right, well, I mean, I've been wearing the mask nonstop and okay, at this point, if I test positive, like, it is what it is. Like it's too good. It's only, you just can't, yeah, you just can't be so uptight for eight weeks about it. You know, in the beginning, people were very, very nervous about testing positive. And then after three, four weeks, it's kind of like, well, we're doing everything we can. And, and now if we test positive, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> I think it's a testament so, yeah. to the adaptive nature of like the humankind. Like we can adapt yeah. to pretty much anything. And you've seen that with players just embracing yeah. this is no fans and COVID testing every three days. That's terrifying. Yeah. Remember in World Team Tennis was the, one of the first bubbles. And first I remember bubbles, that yeah. testing anxiety was out of control. And we only got tested, I think, only three times. But that felt yeah. like you got to focus and you got to yeah. prepare. And then you didn't know oh, what to yeah. expect. And it was so, I mean, such anxiety. I mean, before World Team Tennis, I for like two weeks, I didn't see like a soul here in Austin. I was like, I would go practice. I would literally come sit on my couch. I was like, I'm, my friends are calling me, texting me, like, let's at least meet up for a drink or something. I'm like, no, not happening. Like, and then, but then, you know, we were just so tight, but then now being on tour and whatnot, of course, you're still going to talk to your friends on tour and, you know, but we're still in the bubble. I mean, we're at the courts, at the hotels and we're not going anywhere, but so you kind of just have to relax a little bit and say, Hey, if it happens, it happens, but, but we're going to wear our mask and we're going to be smart about it. But Hey, it is of what course. it is. Of course. I think that's the key thing. You just have to be smart. Just be smart about it. Yeah. Hey everyone, you're listening to an episode of the Tennis.com podcast with doubles pro Nick Monroe. He's sharing what it's like to still be coached by his father at the age of 38. Keep listening. So you also did some Tennis Channel Live action. Can you tell us what that was like? Because live and being on set is a whole different thing. You went to LA, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I started with Tennis Channel. It actually... Um, kind of finalize things with them in April. So we, it's been, you know, we knew it was going to happen, but there were no events going on, but yeah, then I did the tennis channel live set and that was, that was pretty fun. It was pretty interesting because I'd never done commentating and whatnot before, but obviously been around the game since I was four years old and, and, you know, can speak about tennis and know what's going on, especially from the player's side of things. Um, and yeah, my first day with tennis channel was, was commentating the kids pool men's singles final and then being on set like right after. And so, yeah, I mean, the first, that first being on set was a little nerve wracking, just uh, 
kind of not knowing what to expect. But I mean, they prepare you and they let you know kind of what questions are coming and this kind of stuff. So it was definitely a lot of fun. Did that for an entire week, the Rome event. And then now I'm going back to LA on Sunday to do the Paris Masters um, event as well. And we'll be doing Tennis Channel Live. So it's a lot of fun. It's a great crew. Um, you know, you learn a lot from people like Mary Carrillo, Ted Robinson, obviously Paul Anico, Lindsay Davenport, Tracy Austin. They've been doing this stuff for years, you know, and so to learn from them is, is, is quite, you know, quite amazing for me. And, and so I'm, yeah, I'm excited to go back next week and then, you know, keep on following things up uh, leading into next year. So you say that uh, you learn so much from the legends. What's the biggest takeaway? You know what? I mean, it's funny, like <laughs> working with Mary Carrillo was one of my favorite things we, you know, doing. We love the her. Rome, We're a big the, fan. Yeah. So, so we were, we're commentating the Rome event and, being in LA, we're having to get to the studio at 1 a.m. and then commentate it too, right? So basically, I'm sleeping from 9 p.m. till 12:30 midnight, 12:30, then going into the studio at one, and then we're commentating it too. So I remember the first morning I was doing that, I was like, "Man, this is pretty early," you know. And and so you're commentating these matches, and you got to be upbeat and ready to go. And so I got there at 1 a.m. and I'm you know, an hour before we're starting and I'm pretty tired, obviously. And I get in there and Mary Carrillo was already there. She got there at 1230 and I walk in and she's just like, Hey, how's it going? You know, just so much energy and ready to go. And, you know, she's just an absolute pro, you know, and, and just, uh, you know, the biggest thing is, is, you know, what they tell you is just be yourself, you know, and a lot of it is, is about telling the why things are happening, but, but, you know, just really being yourself and just letting it, letting it ride. And she is, she definitely does that, and, and we, have, we have a lot of fun together in, in that aspect. So, you know, a lot of jokes, a lot of conversations. Um, so, yeah, it, I mean, it's a great crew. I mean, she's been doing the Olympics and all kinds of different sports. So it's a great crew at Tennis Channel, and, and so it's been exciting, and, and we'll keep being fun. It's such a cool gig. It sounds so like luxurious being flown to LA <laughs> or French Open or wherever and getting to be on set. But then I hear things like, yeah, you started at 2am and I'm like, okay, so there is a lot <laughs> of challenges to this kind of career that seems like so, it, I mean, obviously is an awesome gig. Right. Yeah, no, no. It, it, that's one thing people don't realize, right? Because they turn on their TV at, you know, whatever, if they're watching at noon or 1pm or 2pm and they're showing the rerun of a match or something, but they don't realize that the people commentating that match were up at one or 2 a.m. commentating, you know, so you got to be, you got to be ready to go because if you're commentating, you don't sound, you know, like, like you're into it, then people are like, what's wrong with this guy? It's 2 p.m., you know? <laughs> the haters are coming, so, yeah. yeah. And the thing yeah. is, too, like, if the, the match is super long and you're on no sleep and you're just no like, sleep. oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. and then actually, like, settling down after that because then you have to get ready for the following day and right. sleep all day, which is so strange. Yeah, so, so. exactly, exactly. But we're it's, on it's the night shift. We're working yeah. the night shift. <laughs> yeah. Our experience yeah. is minimal. I did a few world team tennis matches during normal hours. Arena did the U S open during normal hours, but mm -hmm. you know, right. who, who knows what the future holds. And in Paris though, you did some of the uh, videos and stuff, tennis channel, but you also played yeah. with one Tommy Paul quarterfinals. <laughs> what was that yeah. like? How'd you guys pair up? I love the age gap. I love his energy. I love yours. Yeah. It's fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that was, uh, that was interesting. So, I mean, Tommy and I've known each other for a little while and, and we, so there at World Team Tennis was kind of how we, we started talking about it. Like the third day that we were there, I, I was like, Tommy, you know, you want to play doubles at, in Paris? And he was like, yeah, man, for sure. And we we never played doubles before. We never, you know, but it was kind of one of those things where, you know, we have great energy when we're together. And so it was like, yeah, why not? Let's just give it a shot. And so that was our first time playing was there, Roland Garros. And, and uh, you know, one thing about Tommy is he, I mean, he's just so super talented and he, but he wants to learn doubles, you know, like, you know, obviously, I mean, the guy would beat me 0-0 in a singles match probably, but, but on the doubles court, like he, he knows I can teach him some things and, and where to be on the court and what shots to hit that'll help set up the, you know, his partner set me up. And so, you know, we had great energy out there in Paris and, you know, it was funny because he was like, well, you know, tell me where I should hit this ball or that ball or whatever. But, you know, with guys like that who are so talented, you want them to just play their game. And then, you know, maybe there's one or two things that you can that you can help them with. But, you know, especially for me on my serve, the guy's so athletic. So I want the guy poaching and flying around and just being yeah, athletic instead of just kind of sometimes singles players can get very stagnant out there and not want to move and scared to miss a shot. And it's like, no, 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 I want you to be an athlete. And so for Tommy, when I told him, Hey man, just be yourself, freaking 
be an athlete, you know, then he was, he was all over the court, you know, and that, and that's what I love seeing from, from TP. And so we, we had, you know, three great wins there making the quarters and, and had somewhat of a shot in, in the quarterfinals, but yeah, we're excited. We we're going to play some more next year. And so it'll be, it'll be, be a lot of fun. Yeah. We definitely have quite the age gap. I was like, man, I mean, I'm freaking 14 years older than you. And I was like that. Yeah. Almost to the point where I was like near driving by the time that you were born, you know, like that's, oh, wow. it's, 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 it's just, it's just crazy to me to think of that, you know? And, and so anyways, we, we have a, a lot of good energy together. So it's fun. So this is coming from a fan question. Okay. All right, so this is like a debatable topic. You are a doubles player. Would you typically yep. choose a singles player that's really good or a doubles player as a partner that's really good? Woo, that's tough because there's positives and negatives to both. I mean, right? You know, to be to be honest, I mean, okay. So the reason to play with a very good doubles player is because obviously, then you all can practice together and you all can work out your plays and 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 really be on the same page all the time. Um, and then on the singles player side of things, whether it's a Jack Sock or a Donald Young or a Tommy Paul, sometimes they, they can take the racket out of the opponent's hand, right? So with Jack, he can hit an unbelievable return that, you know, as doubles players, we're like, how did the guy hit that or whatever, you know? And so same with Tommy. I mean, and so what I come, come to say, like, I, I really enjoy playing with singles players because I can let them kind of do what they do and set them up in ways to the tennis Sangrens, the Donald Youngs, the Tommy Falls, they have such big forehands. So I can set up the ball to wait to where they have to hit, get to hit a lot of forehands, you know? And so anyways, I've kind of, yeah, I mean, I've kind of transitioned into really enjoying playing with a lot of singles players um, and just trying to be able to set them up and then help teach them how to set me up, you know? And, and so, yeah, I've, you know, for this Australian Open, I'll be playing with Francis Tiafo coming up next year. And so, you know, that'll be another fun, interesting way to, to try to set him up and make him the best player that he can be on the doubles court you know and so um yeah and, and then when you play with singles players from my standpoint then I just basically I focus on myself on becoming a better player in practice I'm not able to practice with Francis or Tommy every day like you would your normal doubles partner but I'm able to focus on the things I need to focus on in practice you know with my coach or with other guys like more serves more returns more things like I can just focus on myself and becoming a better player which then will help out any team that you're on, whether you're with a doubles player or a singles player, you know, all that stuff you work on will help. So I would say, would I prefer this trick question? I guess I'll say singles player for right now, since I'm going mostly singles players, I'm going to stick with it. All right. (laughs) You're like the doubles guru of American tennis. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Leading these these children onto the courts and teaching them new ways. Exactly. Exactly. Taking the 24 year olds of Francis, Francis Tiafo and Tommy Paul showing a few things. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you need someone always. Did you, and and I think also on your singles comment earlier, do you, have you noticed that having a top singles player as a partner has boosted the popularity of doubles? The more eyeballs will be on someone like a Tiafo, not just because you're partnered with them, obviously you're going to, mesh together perfectly but is it because singles players are playing a little more doubles we're getting a little bit more action now yeah i mean i think that that that's that's definitely gonna put more eyeballs on doubles i mean i played with benoit pair a couple of weeks ago and i had like some of my friends being like oh you're playing with benoit you know and and so obviously i mean they they follow me but the fact that you're playing with a benoit or a francis yeah that puts more eyes on on the doubles and and sure that's what we've been wanting i mean we want more doubles on tv you know i think I think fans really enjoy doubles, um, you know, so yeah, the more singles guys that can play and, and enjoy playing, um, the better it is for, for the game, you know, and, and, uh, and it only makes as doubles players only makes us better too, because we, we have to become better players to be able to hang with the singles players from the baseline and, and adjust to their pace and different things like that. So it, it just helps the game evolve. And I think for fans, they really enjoy watching the singles guys play. I can see that. And it it sounds like you have a pretty clear plan of what you're going to do next, preparing for Australia, right? 2021. Do you know roughly like what your schedule looks like in tournaments and tennis channel, all that's kind of balanced. How how many months in advance do you even have an idea? Um, Well, she is, I mean, right now we don't have a schedule at all for, for the ATP event. I mean, our ATP events, they haven't given us anything. We know that we need to be in Australia kind of mid January, December 15, 16th. Um, ATP cup, I guess is still not sure of happening. Um, and then 
yeah, and then there's going to be a couple of events leading into Australian Open. Um, but other than that, we, we just don't know much. I mean, we don't know really anything of the past January. And we don't even really know which events are leading into Australian Open. You know, like if Auckland's going to happen or if it's Brisbane, Sydney. Like, we don't really know anything. Um, we just know we need to be in Australia around that time and, and, then, and then see what events pop up on the challenger schedule or what it might be, you know. And, and uh, But, again, at least we know that Australian Open will happen. So at least we – have something that we're training for um, and then leading up to it, you just got, you then we'll be ready for it. But, um, but yeah, so, and then with tennis channel, I mean, I'm excited to, to keep going with, with them and, and just, you know, and filling in when I can with, with, with the events, you know, and, and, and again, if I'm not able to be in LA, things like that, it's been really cool to be able to show the behind the scenes of what the players are going through and the locker rooms and the COVID tests and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I'll be able to show that, in Australian Open as well for the fans for the tennis channel. Also, be great. You're going to be fantastic. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you know, Francis play. I, I'm sure yeah. you guys are just going to be phenomenal on court. A couple athletes out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think, I mean, like you said, I think you guys are going to mesh well because you get along off the court and that's exactly. just so important. And, uh, you know, a lot of people always think like, oh, the best player and the second best player, they're going to play doubles together and it's going to be great. It's not always the case. That's not how, not how it happens yet. So it seems as though you've, you've, you have probably figured out by now what works for you. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we wish you the best of luck and um, just keep rolling with the punches and have to adapt as, you know, as whatever yeah. we get. You just have to adapt with whatever whatever happens next year so thank you so much for taking the time yeah thanks guys i really appreciate you guys having me on and uh you know this is awesome so i really appreciate you guys having me awesome thanks awesome. Nick. thanks from the tennis channel podcast network this has been the tennis.com podcast be sure to subscribe to stay caught up we're available on apple podcasts spotify and every major listening app as well as tennis.com slash podcasts. You can also see the videos of our episodes on Tennis Channel's YouTube page and tennis.com's Facebook page. We're your hosts, Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. We'd like to thank our team, editor and audio designer and video editor, Christina Koseva, producers, Alexa March and Sean O'Malley, and executive producers, Shelby Coleman, Kyle Einhorn, and Andy Chu.